Welcome to chapter four. And in chapter four, we're going to begin to look at uh, some basics of trigonometry and the trigonometric functions. <clears throat> so we're going to first look at just a bunch of vocabulary and some definitions so that we're all working on the same page. Anytime you uh, introduce a new area of math here, you've got to work with a whole new set of uh, definitions and words that Sometimes means specific things in other situations, but in mathematics, will mean some very specific things. When we talk about a ray, <clears throat> um, typically we we call lines um, the lines in general go go on forever. But if we have a starting point of a line, and then the other end of it is is a never ending uh, line, so it's a line with a starting point in essence. We call that a ray. So it's a portion of a line made up of a point, which we call the endpoint, and all the points on the line to one side of the endpoint. And of course, if they're on a line, they have to be straight. So, <clears throat> and when we connect these uh, rays together with the same endpoint, we have angles that form. So I could just draw another one in here. There we have an angle that forms between those two rays. And uh, if we if we just move one of them, and one of them stays. Uh, stationary, uh, that's th those are the type of angles. The ray in its original position is called the initial side, and, while the ray in a new position after rotation is called the terminal side. So if this particular line here, I'll just shade it with a different color, is staying still, and we're moving this one part here, this would be the terminal side, and this would be the initial side, the other one. <clears throat> and then we call this the vertex. In the context of uh, an angle, this would be the vertex. Let's look at some more just kind of pictures of, of what we're talking about. <clears throat> so um, if the rotation of the initial side to the terminal side is counterclockwise, then we're going in a, we have a positive angle. Um, so if we're moving in this direction, uh, positive. If this is our initial side, we're moving in this direction. That's negative. And, <clears throat> you know, we're really just switching sides there, saying one is the initial side, one is the terminal side, right? But moving in a clockwise position is uh, a negative angle. Counterclockwise is a positive angle. So that's a little counterintuitive there. <clears throat> we can also have angles that go, that are similar, right? They end up in the same place, even though they go in a different direction. For example, here we have uh, going in a positive way. And then if we start here, but we go around twice and come up here, but we land with the same terminal side, then we can say that these two angles are coterminal. <clears throat> and this is important because we're going to be operating uh, most of the time within a XY coordinate plane, where the X axis usually we consider our initial side. So, an angle in a rectangular coordinate system is said to be in standard position if its vertex is at the origin and its initial side coincides with a positive X axis. So, we're, we're kind of always looking at this as my starting point, and then we're looking at the direction that our angles go. So if we go to the left here, this would be a negative angle, right? And But if we went in this direction, uh, that would be a positive angle. And both of these angles would be coterminal, meaning they ended up with the same terminal side. So if the terminal side of an angle in standard position lies on the x-axis or the y-axis, we say that angle is a quadrantal angle, quadrantal angle. Um, and that's not a word we use a whole, a whole lot, but it is, it is a vocab word you want to be familiar with because uh, it'll pop up. They'll say something about a quadrantal angle. So if I start at my initial side and I end up at a portion of the y-axis, so I could end up here at a 90 degree or all the way to here at 180 degrees. Here is 270 or I can go all the way back over here. <clears throat> Those would all be considered quadrantal angles. Um, also, 
um, if our terminal side doesn't land, isn't quadrantal, we say it's in a quadrant. And just as a reminder about the quadrants, um, this is, we consider this the first quadrant, this is the second quadrant, third quadrant, and then fourth quadrant. In the first quadrant, we have a positive X and a positive Y. In the second quadrant, negative X, positive Y. Third quadrant, negative, negative. And then fourth quadrant, uh, positive, negative. <clears throat> and those are things that you're familiar with, but just as a reminder, it starts here. This is one of the reasons, you know, in trigonometry, uh, we start at that side. The quadrants kind of follow that idea there. Most of our measurements that we've done and the context in which you've uh, worked with them have usually been in terms of degrees. And degrees is something we have to take, uh, you know, full circle. And each, uh, and we divide it up 360 equal ways, each one of those being one degree. So a measure of one degree is assigned to an angle resulting from rotation one out of 360 of complete rotation counterclockwise about the vertex. Um, an angle formed by rotating the initial side counterclockwise one full rotation so that the terminal and initial sides coincide has a measurement of 360 degrees written as 360 with the little hollow circle right there. We also classify uh, t different types of angles in different ways. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is just the size of the angle. If we have something that is less than 90 degrees, uh, you know, between zero and 90 degrees, right? So we're just really talking about uh, positive angles here. Uh, so we call those acute angles. They're smaller. And then once those angles reach uh, the quadrantal level, right? So they're hitting the y-axis there. Then that becomes a right angle, which a lot of times you'll see me symbolize those with a little square in there. The book does the same thing. Going more than 90 degrees, we say that something is obtuse, and uh, that can continue going here, right? When we get to 180 degrees, uh, that, of course, it has its own designation. But anything you know more than 180 would still be an obtuse angle. Uh, so obtuse is really anything greater than 90. Acute is anything between zero and 90. And so, you know, like if we go <clears throat> 540 degrees, right? So we've gone all the way around. This is, this 540 degrees represents a straight angle. Going in the opposite direction here, this would be an obtuse angle. And of course, this would be another obtuse angle. <clears throat> landing in the first quadrant here, landing in the fourth quadrant here. All right, so looking to draw some of these angles, um, there's a few things we want to keep in mind. Uh, if this is 90 degrees, right, from here to here, actually, let me go ahead and draw that in here. One thing you want to keep in mind is the halfway point, right? The halfway point between 0 and 90 is 45. So 45 kind of splits that uh, in half, <clears throat> So 60, then, we can kind of use that as a gauge. If we want to draw a terminal side at 60 degrees, it's going to be just a little bit more than half. And so it'd be right about there. Of course, it's all sort of not perfect unless we use some sort of tools. But that would be our 60-degree angle. For 135 degrees, <clears throat> that's going to obviously put us beyond the first uh, quadrant and into the second quadrant. Because at 90 degrees there, uh, we have 90. And then if we go 45 more than 90, notice that little thing there, 45 degrees more than 90, uh, we're at 135. And in fact, if we kept going, that would take us to 180 or to the straight angle. So I know that sometimes we can think of our angles in terms of what they are in relation to the, the either the x-axis or the y-axis. 
right? If I know that this angle is 45 uh, and this angle is 45, then I'm going to try to draw it so it's right in between. And that gives me my 135. We're just trying to be as accurate as we can in terms of position. Of course, just knowing that it's at 135 uh, puts it past the first quadrant into the second quadrant. Of course, we want to put a, this is a ray, so we want to put a little uh, arrow up there. All right, for our first negative, we're going 240, but in a negative direction. So that's going to take me from here back. Remember, by the time we get to here, we're at 180. And if we kept on going all the way to the next y-axis, we'd be at 270, which is <clears throat> 270 is too far. Uh, we only want to go negative 240. So I've got to shave about 30, uh, 30 degrees off that angle, right? Because 240 minus thir or 270 minus 30 is 240. And so that leaves me with a 60 in one direction, which, uh, let me go ahead and draw this in here. If there's 30 from here to here, then this is 60. So it's akin to what we drew over here when we try to go a little bit beyond the middle part when we drew 60 degrees, All right? So we want them to kind of look similar. I'm just drawing these extra in here so we start to get an idea. In fact, if you think about 90, uh, 30 is about a th is one third of 90, 60 is two thirds of 90. And so we're going two thirds of the way through that, that area there. And our last one is 405. So one thing we know is that since we're going in a positive direction, we always start with the x-axis here. Once I get to here, I've gone 360. So if I go 360 and 405 and find their difference, that's what I want to aim for here. And uh, that would be 45 degrees. <clears throat> In other words, 360 plus 45 more takes me to 405. And we know that that 45 degrees is kind of the halfway deal. Uh, so let's finish this off going in the right area and then ending up right in the middle of those two. This would be 405 degrees, which leaves me with 45 degrees between here and the x-axis, right? So those two angles would be coterminal. Uh, they both end at the same spot. Uh, and they're both positive, so it doesn't always go um, in, you know, a negative, or doesn't always go, sorry, I was saying too many things here. Uh, whoops, where is the four? <clears throat> so they don't have to, one doesn't have to be positive and one doesn't have to be negative to be coterminal. That's what I was trying to say there. As we look at angles that are not exactly at one degree, or maybe they're kind of in between zero and one degree, like half a degree, <clears throat> we need a, a better way to express those. And so what we do is we divide each degree into 60 equal parts within that one degree. Hard for me to do, but let's say we had, this was one degree, it's definitely not. But if we took this one degree and we divided it evenly 60 different ways, which I can hardly do because it's just so small, each one of those smaller divisions would be a minute. And then if I took each one of those minutes and I divided those into 60 equal things, I would have seconds. <clears throat> so this is to get really, really, really precise measurements. And um, so, for example... Um, let's take 28 degrees, 8 minutes and 15 seconds. Now, the way we represent minutes is with one little tick mark. The way we can represent seconds is with two tick marks. And uh, <clears throat> 60 times 60 is how we get this 360 here. So... What this is, is really showing is the relationship here. Uh, one minute is equal to uh, one over 60 
degrees. <clears throat> so one minute is one sixtieth of a degree, and one second is one three hundred three thousand six hundredths of a degree. Uh, so converting these over uh, from minutes to seconds, we already or from seconds and minutes to degrees is really just going to make my degrees into a decimal, and that's okay. Um, so I have 28 degrees. We want to convert 8 minutes uh, to degrees as well. So I'm going to take 8 degree or 8 minutes and multiply it by what it would take to make it into a degree. There's 60 minutes for every 1 degree. That's my unit multiplier here. Right, so we, we're basically converting it. So I'm getting rid of the minutes, and then I'm left with degrees. So that, of course, becomes 8 over 60. And 8 divided by 60 is about 0.1333. We're just going to leave it there. It, can, it continues to repeat, of course. <clears throat> And now we're going to add this to also the, the seconds there. We have 15 seconds, so 15 seconds. We want to convert my seconds into minutes. I'm sorry, not minutes. Uh, into degrees. And I know that uh, there are 3,600 seconds for every one degree. <clears throat> so again, the seconds are going to cancel. And so that leaves me with 15 over uh, 3,600. So doing that calculation, we get the decimal point zero zero four one six, And adding these two together, We get 0 0.1375. <clears throat> okay, so that's part of my degrees. This is in degrees, right? We took, uh, this was in degrees, this is in degrees. Added them together, so it's in degrees. So this is equal in degrees to 28.1375. Now let's go in the other direction. Uh, I'm gonna erase what I have here. And we're gonna take this degree measurement here, the degree with decimals, and we're gonna convert this into minutes and seconds. So really, the 67, we're just gonna leave that whole number. The 0.526 is what I'm gonna convert to minutes and then seconds. So first of all, let's, let's go to minutes. We know that this is in degrees, and again, I want to get rid of degrees, I want to turn it into minutes. So my unit multiplier now is 60 minutes for every one degree. I put the degrees on the bottom because I want them to cancel. And so then I go uh, 0.526 times 60, which gives us 31.56. And this, of course, is going to be in degrees. I'm sorry, minutes. Degrees canceled, minutes are left. Now let's get rid of the decimal portion of the uh, minutes. So we have just 31 minutes. We'll leave it as a whole number. So 31 minutes. And we're going to take the 56, the 0.56 minutes, and we want to convert this over to seconds. So remember, the, the relationship here is a little bit different than what we had up here because we're not going from degrees to seconds. We're going from minutes to seconds. Luckily, you guys know these, you know, relationships just from time. Um, so at any rate, 56, sorry, the relationship we have, I already put the 56. Uh, we want to cancel out the minutes and be left with seconds. We know there's one minute for every 60 seconds. So we're gonna end up doing the same multiplication, minutes cancel out. 
and we have 0.56 times 60, which is 33.6. And this is seconds. <clears throat> so um, all of this being equal, we can either leave it as a decimal with my seconds or round it up and just make it 34 seconds if we want them to be whole. So this tells me that 67 0.526 degrees is equal to 67 degrees, 31 minutes, and 34 seconds. I know it's a little odd, but I think the relationship there with the 60s or with the minutes and seconds is the same relationship we're using. What also has to do with 360. Um, regardless, the point is that um, this is something we're applying in a new context. We call it minutes and seconds, but it really has nothing to do with time, minutes and seconds, simply degrees. So just to recap what the unit multipliers we have here are, uh, so we remember those, they're super important. We have one minute is equal to 60, I'm sorry, one degree equals 60 minutes, which is also equal to 3,600 uh, seconds. That's the relationship between one degree and all those other uh, things. And so we can put them in any way, depending on which we want here. Um, we can, I can write it as one degree over 60 minutes if I want to get rid of minutes and be left with degrees. Or if I'm trying to get rid of degrees uh, and do it in minutes, we right it the other way around. These are unit multipliers because one degree is equal to 60 minutes. So when I put them into a fraction, they're really equal to one, one unit. <clears throat> the same is true for the degrees and uh, seconds. I can have one degree over 3,600 seconds. If I'm converting from minutes to seconds or degrees from seconds, sorry, or the other way around. And I need to put little things there. Um, 3,600 seconds over one degree. <clears throat> we can also go with minutes and degrees because we also have that here, but that's not in simplest terms. Uh, the better way would be to write it as one uh, minute is equal to, actually, let me put this in an equality statement. Then we can always put these into the other statements, but uh, one minute equals 60 seconds. So if I'm going from seconds to minutes or minutes to seconds, this is the relationship that we want to use. Converting things is actually pretty easy once you know what the relationship is between one and the other. Then you have to ask, what do I have and what, what do I want it to be? What you have, the units that you have, you want to get rid of. So when you write your unit multiplier, you put in the denominator whatever it is you're trying to get rid of. So it cancels. That makes it a lot easier to, and you can convert from anything using that method. Now degrees is something that you're used to seeing, but it isn't what we will always use uh, in trigonometry. In fact, we tend to favor a different way of measuring rather than, you know, if you think about the degrees, it's like, okay, well, why 360? Like who picked that number? It's just something that's been used uh, and there's patterns and it divides in certain ways. So it's, it's handy in some ways, but um, we have other ways of breaking up and describing an angle, and one of those is called the radian. And <clears throat> the way we define one radian is every circle, of course, has a radius, and we typically will write that as r. Uh, so, for example, in this particular thing here, I'm shading it in blue, but that's the radius of this particular circle. <clears throat> so let's say I take this ray and I move it until I get an arc length on this that's equal to the radius. So that the arc it intercepts on the circle, if you measure it, is equal to the radius of the circle. We would say that angle, right, the angle we're Depicting here with theta, that little symbol is a theta. And we use theta a lot for angles. There's a few other Greek symbols that we use, but theta is the most common one. 
So we say theta equals one radian. Once the intercepted arc equals the radius of the circle, uh, we have one radian. And it doesn't matter what your radius is, the angle it creates will be the same for any r, right? So if, if my circle was twice as big, and uh, let's say it went out to here, and I went this far as well, it would be at this point where my arc, let me see if I can maybe put it in a different color here, my arc here is equal to this radius, right? it would be the same theta, same angle. It's just the way it works on a circle. What ends up happening then, uh, if we're looking at the x-axis, right, is that you'll see that this R goes here, and we end up with six different R's within the span of a circle. R will repeat itself six different times, and then a little bit more. That's because of the type of circumference we have on a circle. Um, it's two pi, right? The distance around a circle is two uh, pi. This, in fact, the circumference two pi r uh, <clears throat> is the formula for the uh, circumference of a circle. So it's two pi multiplied by whatever the radius is. Two pi has a uh, value of approximately because Pi is not actually a number we can um, uh, write out. We can only write it approximately. And it's approximately equal to 6.28. And of course, uh, then we have to multiply it by whatever the, the radius of the circle is. <clears throat> so um, you'll notice that 0.28 then would be that this part here, right? The part in between uh, that completes the whole circle. So it ends up in a little awkward way, but it actually ends up being uh, fairly easy to use, but it is something you have to get used to. So this leads us to a bit of a definition of the radian measure of a central angle. We say that the, the measure theta of a central angle that intercepts an arc of length s on a circle of radius r is defined by s divided by r. We could see that when we were on our circle, and let me just draw a little example here. Um, and I'm just gonna draw a circle. It's not gonna be a great circle. Um, yeah, okay. Well, let's just, if you guys are okay with living like uh, living with that, that's okay. Um, so what we saw initially is that when we went a certain distance, and um, I was theta, and the distance here was r, and when it matched, if this was s, so if s was equal to r, right, so the two lengths uh, matched each other, then we would have, uh, according to this, theta equal to, since s is equal to r, r over r, which is one radian, right? If it's a little bit more, uh, then it's gonna come out in a decimal, right? So if, if uh, S is greater than R, and say we're going all the way over to here, for example, um, this S2 the, would be S2, whatever that arc length is, divided by R. <clears throat> and that would be the number of radians. So that's, that's our, our official definition of radians. But let's look at some actual ways that we can convert from one to the other. To do that, we have to have our unit multipliers, right? We have to know what is equal to what. And um, we saw earlier that if we went all the way around the circle, that the radian measurement is uh, 360 degrees. And all the way around a circle with a uh, unit let's just say a radius of one is two times pi times my r, which is one. Uh, and so we get 360 is equal to two pi. Two pi is the distance around a unit circle where the radius is one. Of course, the radius is a little bit higher than that changes, but the base measurement for our radians will, uh, once we divide it by r, will come out uh, to this. <clears throat> so, um, Simplifying this, 
just a little bit, we can divide out the two, and this is where we get our unit multipliers. So 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. So if I talk about pi radians, I'm talking about an angle that's a straight angle. And then if I go all the way around, that's two radians, <clears throat> or two pi radians, sorry. So these are our unit multipliers, and so we can use these in whatever order we need to convert. So let's take an example. Uh, okay, so going from degrees to radians. So I wanna get rid of my degrees and I want to be left with radians. That means for my unit multiplier here is going to be uh, radians on top, degrees on the bottom. I'll use the little symbol. Okay, and we know that the relationship here is that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. <clears throat> so converting 30, 30 degrees, we'll put 30 over 1, uh, and then I'm going to multiply that by pi radians over 180 degrees. So that's 30 pi over 180. The degrees cancel, <clears throat> and 30 can go into... Uh, 180, six times. Six times 30 is 180. So that leaves me with pi over six. So 30 degrees in radian measurement is pi over six radians. Let's try 90 degrees. So we have 90 degrees. We'll put that over one. We want to get rid of it. So we put the 180 degrees on bottom pi radians on top, and uh, <clears throat> that gives me 90 pi over 180, and my degrees cancel out. I'm going to be left with radians, and 90 goes into 180 twice. So we see, okay, a line that keeps popping up that I don't want. <laughs> I'll try this again. Uh, so this would be pi over 2, since 90 goes evenly into 180 twice. So 90 degrees is equal to pi over 2 radians. Great. Let's go to negative 225. The negative really doesn't matter. We'll just keep the negative thing going. Uh, but what is it in terms of radians? Pi radians over... 180 degrees. <clears throat> so that's negative 225 times pi over 180. How can we reduce this? Uh, I think 45 might go into 225, and it does five times. So I'm going to take out the 45 degrees. Oops, sorry. We'll take out the 45. We're left with five. 225 divided by 45 is 5, and uh, 45 also goes into 180 four times, because 245s is a 90, so that's four times. So uh, negative 225 degrees in radians would be negative 5 pi over 4. In fact, if we yeah, if you think of this as 5 times pi over 4, that's like 5 times 45, which actually pi over 4, we sorry, we didn't we didn't establish that yet, but pi over 4 is 45 degrees. If you take pi, which is 180 and divide it up four ways, it comes out to 45. So, if we went 5 times 45, that gives us negative 225. <clears throat> All right, and then our last one here, we need a, let's go with black. I've done that. So we have 55 degrees uh, multiplied, this is over 1, by pi radians over 180 degrees. And does 55 go into uh, 180? No, it does not. Um, <clears throat> but... I know 5 probably does, right? 5 goes into 55 11 times. And how many times does 5 go into 180? 36 times. So that would be 11 
11 pi over uh, 36. And 11 and 36 don't share anything. Uh, this is not really a special uh, thing. If we want to approximate it, we can. We just have to multiply 11 times 3.14 approximately divided by 36. And this is a <clears throat> about 0.959 radians. So less than one radian. And that's an approximation there. And a lot of these, uh, you know, come out pretty small. Take 3.14 and divide it by 180, right? That tells you how many uh, radians you have. So radians are, are pretty small in terms of decimals, much less than degrees. All right, let's go the other way. Again, it's the same relationship, except we're doing it uh, with the flipped version of that same unit multiplier. So starting out with pi over three radians, we'll just put the radian up on the top, okay? Because it, it'll work out fine that way. <clears throat> um, the radians, you would put it over one and uh, it would end up on the top anyways. And so that gives you the idea of where we want to go with this. We want radians to be on the bottom. We want degrees to be on top. And we know that there's 180 degrees for every pi radian. Um, <clears throat> and we can see right away that things start canceling. The pi cancels here. And then we take 3 into 180. And 180 will go into uh, 3 60 times. So this is equal to, as we saw on the previous page, Pi over, actually, uh, was it 30 degrees? I'm trying to remember what we had. Yeah, we had 30 degrees was pi over 6. So pi over 3 is 60 degrees. Negative 3 pi over 4 radians. Uh, again, multiplied by 180 degrees over pi radians. Uh, and this time the radians here are in the denominator, so they're canceling out. Should have done that back here. And then we're left with degrees. Um, so the pi's cancel. And I can take 4 into 180. That's 45. <clears throat> so then we have 45 times negative 3. That's negative 135. <clears throat> and that's in degrees. The only measurement I have left here. Uh, so negative 3 pi over 4, if you think negative 3 pi over 4 we saw was 45 and 345s gives you 135 you begin to kind of get comfortable with these radians converting them in your head so you know what they are in terms of degrees until you get so used to radians you don't even think of it in terms of degrees and what about one radian what is that equal to well let's see one radian over one again we're going to multiply it by 180 degrees over pi radians, uh, radians cancel, and so I'm left with 180 divided by pi degrees. We probably want to, we don't typically have pi as, it, as present in a degree, but if I go 180 and I divide it by pi, or 3.14 approximately, we see that this is about 57.32 degrees, which remember on the previous one, this would be, you know, one radian. Remember on our previous one, we had a little less than one. Notice that it was 55, so just a little bit less than the one radian mark, which is kind of confirms what we have there, 57.32 degrees. Now, since, uh, when we talk about coterminal angles, and an angle is created by rotating a ray around in a circle, um, you can kind of begin to realize that there's an infinite number of coterminal angles out there. Um, in fact, I can take any angle and I can add two pi to it, and I have a coterminal angle 
or if it's in degrees, I can add 360 or yeah, add 360 to it. I can add three six uh, three, two pi once, or I could add it twice or three times. Right? How many times am I going around the circle, basically? So n just has to be some sort of n measurement. Some, and each of those would represent one time, two times, three times around the circle in positive or negative directions. Um, so when we say it's an integer, that means that a whole number positive or negative. Um, and so infinite number of coterminal angles. We actually, this, this is one little chart that I think can be helpful to you as a reference as we're going through these. Um, if you're not familiar with them, you're going to be familiar with them after a while. The key relationship to keep in mind is the, the, the 180, right? That, that 180 is pi times around. And then the other three key relationships to keep in mind are 30, 45, and 60. These just happen to pop, pop up a lot. Um, <clears throat> if I take pi, which is 180 degrees, right? And I divide it up evenly four ways, that would be one, two, three, and then four. So uh, it, it takes four 45 degrees to get me to 180. <clears throat> so for example, with pi over four being 45, um, if I have three pi over fours, that means I went one, two, three times there, right? I went 45 degrees three times. The second time I got to 90, and of course that would be two pi over fours. That would be two pi over fours, but that reduces down to pi over two, <clears throat> which is pi, remember 180 divided by two is 90. So there's, there's relationships here where it's just not random numbers. You can look at the pi and when it's over and see a relationship here. Uh, for example, again, let's look at pi over six. Pi over six, we take 180, divide it up six ways. Remember, six times three is 18, right? So 180 divided up six ways is 30, divided up three ways is 60. But if I take <coughs> two pi over sixes, two pi over six gives me pi over three, which is 60. Two 30 degree angles, two pi over sixes is 60 degrees, but that leaves me with pi over three, right? So we can look that pi over three is always 60, pi over six is 30. Uh, so for example, if I'm just trying to interpret something like, uh, you know, five pi over six, now the circle we can see that it's 150, but a li little bit harder to see that when I'm uh, not when I'm not looking at the key, basically. So how can we interpret that? Well, pi over 6 is 30. And if I get 5 30s, 5 times 30 is 150. Right? So pi over 6 is, is 30, and 5 30s give me 15 or 150. Right? And you can also tell, hey, this is going to be in the second quadrant because it's less than pi. 6 pi over 6, if I went 30 degrees more, would be at pi, six pi over six, the sixes cancel out, and I'm just left with pi. So there's those little relationships you can do. These are the positive, these would be where they would be negative wise. They're just a flip version of each other. But all of these numbers are divisible with each other, and so they're easy numbers for us to use. All right, so it does help us to think of what the angle would be in that zero to two pi range. And so if we're given stuff that's outside of that, um, it's helpful for us to, to kind of convert it back, right? So let's look at something like 19 pi over 4. Okay, so that's 19 45 degree angles. Uh, can, we, can we remove something from that? As I'm thinking about it, I like to think of where is my uh, 2 pi, which is a full complete circle, where is that? At with this denominator. <clears throat> in other words, what what do I? Uh, what gives me? How many times would I have to go pi over four times to go a complete circle? And that's pretty easy because we know that 
8 pi over 4, 4 would go into 8 twice, so that would be 2 pi, right? So 8 pi's over 4 would be uh, one rotation. So then if I had two rotations, that would be 16 pi over 4. That would be 4 pi. That's two rotations. And then we're just going three more than that, right? So I've gone one time around. That was 8 pi over 4. I've gone around another time, and that was 16 pi over 4. And I want to go to 19 pi. We know that pi, you know, two of them take me up to here, and then one more would put me over here into the second quadrant. So <clears throat> I like to draw circles like that. So by the time I get to 16 pi over 4, I can see that now I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm past the big numbers now. 19 minus 16 is 3. So 3 pi over 4 would be the uh, angle equivalent or coterminal with 19 pi over 4. Okay, well, what about uh, negative 17 pi over 6? Now we have pi over 6. Again, 6 goes into what uh, twice? Well, it goes into 12. So I know that 12 pi over 6 is equal to 2 pi because 6 would go into 12 twice, so that would cancel. That's one full rotation, right? And we're going in a negative direction, which is just neither here nor there. Um, by the time I go around once, I've gone uh, 12 pi over 6. Why am I doing that? Because that's the thing I'm using, right? And then, so then we go 17, what's 17 minus 12? Well, that 17 minus 12 is 5 pi over 6. And so I would go almost 180 degrees more. Remember, 5 pi over 6 is just shy of a full 180. 6 pi over 6 would be a full 180. 5 pi over 6 just short, just stops short of going past that uh, other x-axis. So in terms of negative uh, things, let's remember our negative there, negative 17 pi over 6 would be equal to negative <clears throat> 5 pi over 6. But, oh, we we, uh, we need to put this in terms between positive 0 and 2 pi. Well, here I go uh, all the way. That's pi. And then I'm going to go another 30 degrees. So uh, 6 pi over 6 is pi. But then I go one more 30 degrees, so one more pi over 6. So that's 7 pi pi over 6 in terms of the uh, positive direction. So this is also equal to and coterminal to 7 pi over 6. Again, the key relationship here is remembering the key things. 2 pi is 360, 1 pi is 180. And, and then the pi over 4 is 45 degrees, pi over 6 is 30 degrees, and pi over 3 is 60 degrees. Another couple of words that you hear a lot about in when we talk about angles, whether it's geometry or trigonometry, um, complements and supplements. Complements, of course, we tend to think of nice things people say to us, but in mathematics, they mean two positive angles. So notice that it's we're just dealing with the positives there that uh, add up to 90 degrees. <clears throat> if they add up to 180 degrees, two positive angles, we have supplements or supplementary angles. So here we're going to say whether they have a complement or a supplement, and if so, what they are. So for A, um, 73 degrees... We think, what do we have to add to that to get to 90? Well, if we add 7 to 73, that takes us to 80. 10 more takes us to 90. So we see that 17 degrees uh, would be its complement. 
And then if we add 90 to 17, uh, that would be 107. Right, because all I had to do was to go 90 degrees more and I would be at 180. <clears throat> so that would be our complement and supplement of 73 degrees. What about 110? 110 degrees. Well, remember, they have to be two positive angles. The only thing that I could add to 110 and to have it be 90 degrees would be a negative 20 degrees. So there is no complement to 110 degrees. But there is a supplement with 80 degrees more. I would have 180 degrees. I'm sorry, I went a little too high there. Not 80 degrees. I'm thinking in terms of like 90, but 70 degrees. 70 degrees would take me to 180. So 110 and 70 degrees are supplementary angles. Remember that when we started out, we established the, the sort of definition of a radian. And a radian is a description of a arc or a uh, angle. <clears throat> Sorry. And we defined radian as being uh, the arc length divided by the radius. Arc length divided by the radius. I don't know why my pen's having a hard time here. And we can remember this because, remember, if the arc length is equal to the radius, we have r over r, which is one radian. So that's our definition. Solving this for r by multiplying both sides by r gives me another formula that's useful, which is the arc length formula. We can actually measure the, uh, the arc length of a circle by taking the radian measurement and multiplying it by radius. Notice that this doesn't work uh, if theta is in degrees. It has to be in radians. Again, this goes back to the whole definition of, of it's derived from our definition of radians. So theta always needs to be in radians, but this will give us the arc length of the circle for any circle of any size with a radius of r. So here's an example. A, a circle has a radius of 18 inches. Find the length of the arc intercepted by a central angle with measure 210 degrees. So we have, an, we have a, a circle, right? And the, the radius of the circle is 18 inches. And uh, actually, let me rewrite that here. Let's move the, that line down. And just, I'm gonna put it on the, the initial side here. And then we rotate this around and we go uh, 210, so that's going to be just a little bit more than 180, 180 plus 30 degrees. So again, I'm just kind of approximating here. My radius is 18. I'm going to write that in. And we want to know what the arc length is. So in other words, what I want to know that with this 210 uh, degree thing, what the length there is of that blue line. So the first thing we have to do is convert 210 into radians. 210 degrees, uh, put that over one. Let's convert that. And the conversion is going to be, we wanna get rid of degrees and we want it to be in radians. So that's pi over 180. <clears throat> and uh, so we, we end up with 210 pi over 180. My suspicion, since 7 times, you know, 3 is 21, that 30 is going to go into this 7 times. 30, of course, goes into 180 uh, 6 times. So that's 7 pi over 6. A quicker way to think of this, rather than, you know, using this conversion method every time, is <clears throat> to think about 210 and think about what goes into it. Uh, so we know 21, of course, 7 times 3. Uh, so 210 would be 7 times 30. So if I know pi over 6 is 30 degrees, which we do, 
then the seven we know belongs on top, right? Remember six pi over six would be 180 degrees. Uh, so if I go one more pi over six, it would give me seven pi over, pi over six. <clears throat> All right, so anyway, that's my radian measurement there. And so to find the measure of the arc when we have a circle that's has a radius of 18 uh, inches, the arc length is going to be, I got these, let's try that again. Uh, so I have the arc length, S, is going to be equal to uh, 7 pi over 6 multiplied by 18. S equals theta times R. And 18 being in the numerator, 6 luckily goes into 18 three times, so that gives me 21 pi is the length there <clears throat> of the arc. And that would be in inches, because this was uh, 18 uh, inches. <clears throat> so 21 times 3.14 gives me approximately, there we go, 65.94 inches. Let's look at this in a more sort of how an arc length could actually be helpful in drawing some uh, calculations that we wouldn't necessarily think. Like when we talk about the, the Earth and uh, the flat but round surface of the Earth, um, we can look at the different distances from the equator. The equator's at the center point there uh, of the Earth. And so moving up from that, we can measure those angles and we can find distances because distances from cities are actually arc lengths rather than straight lines. They're not. That's why, you, you know, when planes fly, you see these sort of arcs that they make. Not because they're trying to go, because we all know that the shortest distance between two points uh, is a straight line. But the reason they're traveling in these arcs is because they're flying not in a straight line, uh, but in an arc, right? So we obtain the latitude location L on Earth by first finding the point of intersection P between the meridian through L and the equator. <clears throat> uh, so the latitude L, here we go, the latitude measurement, is the angle formed by rays drawn from the center of the Earth to points L and P. So from here to here, we have the center point of this circle. Right, if, we, if we cut out this distance here, we would have a circle. Um, the latitude L of the angle formed by the rays drawn from the uh, center of the Earth to points L and P, with the ray uh, through P being the initial ray. <clears throat> All right, so this is my initial side, and we go up. We can find kind of a distance here. So here's a, here's a specific problem. Billings, Montana is due north of Grand Junction, Colorado. Find the distance between Billings which is at this latitude, right? So our latitudes are given by these uh, arcs in degrees and minutes. So 45 degrees, 48 minutes north. And Grand Junction is at 39 uh, degrees, uh, 7 minutes north. Use 3,960 miles, almost 4,000 miles, as the radius of the Earth. Because Billings is due north of Grand Junction, the same meridian passes through both cities. Uh, the distance between the cities is the length of the arc S on this meridian, subtended by the uh, central angle theta. That is the difference of their latitudes. So we can see these two cities here on this overarching arc, but we want to know just the different distance between uh, that intersection and this intersection. The two cities just due north of each other. So first off, we subtract these two. Uh, we subtract 48 minus 7 is 41, and then 45 minus 39 is 6. And then we're going to convert this measurement to radians. So here we're going to not use, well, we're going to have to use our calculator a bit. Uh, so um, first of all, let's take 6 degrees in 41 minutes and convert that just to uh, degrees. <clears throat> so 
turning that into degrees, I want to go 41 minutes and figure out what that would be in degrees. So I want to get rid of my minutes. There's 60 minutes for every one degree. Always double check that to make sure you've got them in the right spot. So that means I want to go 41 divided by 60 and 41 divided by 60 is 0.683 approximately. 0.683. So um, we're going to have 6.683 degrees as my degree measurement. Let's convert this to radians. We know that to get rid of degrees, 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. So <clears throat> we're going to divide uh, out the degrees, 6.683. Then we're going to divide that by, or I'm sorry, we're going to multiply it by pi and then divide it by 180. And this will give me 0.117, I'm just taking it out to three spots, 0.117 radians. <clears throat> now that may seem really small, but remember one radian was about 57 degrees or so. So it does make sense that this is like a little more than a tenth, right, of a radian. And then we'll use our arc length formula. Remember, what we just found is the angle. So 0.117, and then we're going to multiply this by r, which was the radius of the Earth, 3960. So 3960 miles is in here. And so we take that time, 0.117, multiply that by 9, or 39, Six zero, and we get four sixty three point three two, and now this is in miles. <clears throat> Good. So that would be the distance from Billings to Grand Junction. I think was the uh, thing. One way or the other, the distance would be the same. It's about four hundred sixty three miles. We also have a formula for uh, the uh, area of a portion of a circle. And um, that area is given by 1 half r squared multiplied by theta, theta being the measurement of the um, area there from the initial side. <clears throat> and uh, so we can use this formula as well to help us find portions of a larger circle. For example, if we want to find the area of the sector of a circle here, we want to know how many square inches of pizza, like that square inches would be how many one by one inches of pizza you've eaten, rounded to the nearest square inch. If you eat a sector of an 18 inch diameter pizza whose edges form a central angle of 30 degrees. 30 degrees, of course, would be what we would get if we split our pizza into... Um, well, that would be 6, so 12, 12, 12 equal slices. <clears throat> okay, sorry, I had to do the math there for myself. <laughs> All right, so remember, 18-inch diameter. Remember the difference between radius and diameter is that uh, diameter is all the way across. So for an, a pizza that's 18 inches across, that means the radius value is 9 inches. So my radius is 9. <clears throat> the area then of that is going to be one half times r, my radius, so nine squared, and then multiplied by uh, <clears throat> the nine being nine inches, multiplied by the angle, which is 30 degrees. What is 30 degrees in radians? Well, it's 180 or pi divided up six ways. So we're going to multiply that by pi over six. <clears throat> So uh, doing some of these out, that would give me 9 squared, which is 81, and I somehow put 18. So 81 over 2 times pi, and then 6. 
So 12, basically, there is what we have on the bottom. So 81 pi over 12. Let's go ahead and just get the approximate decimal value of that by going 81 times 3.14, and then divide that by 12. This gives me 21.2, rounded, 21.2, if I rounded the nearest tenth, inches square or square inches of pizza in a slice that's 30 degrees. Sometimes we want to also measure the how fast something is traveling along the edge of a circle. So first, uh, picture, picture a point here that's at radius r, so that circle has a radius of r. This is my imperfect circle, of course, but it's going around at a certain pace. And what it's traveling along is the, uh, well, the arc, right, of the circle. And so whether we're doing it in seconds or minutes or hours, uh, just depending on that and on the radius of the circle, <clears throat> we can describe the velocity as being the arc length I've traveled per unit of time. Um, I can also talk about its angular speed. So right, so we have the, the angle that's going there uh, by taking the the uh, radians that it has traveled, and we say it's traveling this many radians per unit of time. Combining these two together, since s is equal to r theta, remember s is being my arc length, and r theta is, uh, <clears throat> you know, the radius of the circle multiplied by how many radians we're doing there. We have another velocity, <clears throat> which is r, so my radius, multiplied by the angular speed. Uh, so velocity can be my radius times the angular speed as well. This puts, uh, puts it in terms of distance as well. Okay, so looking at an example here, we've got a plane that is traveling around this circle here. <clears throat> And the distance from my tower to that plane is 12 feet. That doesn't seem like very far um, to be around something. So, okay, this is a model plane, so not a real plane. A model plane is attached to a swivel so that it flies on a particular path at the end of a 12-foot wire at the rate of 15 revolutions per minute. So that's going around pretty fast, but it's not per second, right? It's going around 15 revolutions per minute. Find the angular speed and the linear speed of the plane. So let's start with the angular speed. So looking at what we've been given here, um, we want to take into mind and put into context what we have here. So when we talk about linear speed, those are more of the type, excuse me, types of speeds that we're used to, right? 50 miles per one hour. That would be uh, a distance that you've gone per unit of time. <clears throat> um, and then angular speed is, is measuring it in, you know, how many rotations do we have in a sense? So that's theta. Uh, how many thetas? How many times have we gone around or how far have we gone angle-wise per unit of time? And this formula is just another way of expressing linear speed. We take the angular speed, which is radians per minute, and we just multiply it by the radian measurement. Uh, and that will convert a angular speed into a linear speed. Now, the only angle that we've been given here is that it's traveling at 15 revolutions per minute. And we want to find first the angular speed. So we want to convert 15 revolutions per minute uh, to what it would be as an angle. So I'm going to do this over here. 15 revolutions for every one minute. All right, well, how much would a revolution be in terms of radians? We want to convert this to radians per minute. We want to get rid of revolutions. <clears throat> so uh, we want to know what's the relationship between one revolution and one radian. Well, we know that we would have, for one revolution, 
that would be one uh, trip around the circle, so to say. So that would be 2 pi radians. So one revolution is equal to 2 pi, right? That's the distance around uh, the circle in terms of radians. So this would be 15 times 2 pi. <clears throat> so that's uh, for every minute. That's going to be 30 pi per one minute. <clears throat> this would be my angular speed. Angular speed was uh, in distance radians per minute. <clears throat> and we can go back and kind of see that just here. It's radians for every you know, unit of time. And we had 15 revolutions per minute, so we just had to convert that revolutions over to theta. So now I have the angular speed, and we want to convert this now to linear speed. <clears throat> so we know that linear speed, V, uh, is either arc lengths per unit of time, but we also saw that if we took the angular speed and we multiply that by the radians, <clears throat> the radius of the circle, that would give me also my linear speed. So if I take uh, my speed, which is 30 pi, uh, 30 pi per minute, <clears throat> and I multiply that by how far out it is, that's really giving me um, the distance there, which I believe was 15 feet. Nope, I have, it's a 12-foot wire, sorry. Getting my numbers mixed up here. So we're actually going to multiply that by the radius of the circle, which is the length of the wire, really. So uh, 30 times 12. This is 30 pi per one minute. And this is 12 radians. Uh, so 30 times 12 gives me... This is 360 uh, pi. <clears throat> 12 times 30 is 360, interesting enough. And, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, not radians. That 12 was in feet. So that's 12 feet of wire that we had attached to our plane. Uh, so our final answer here is in feet. Let's get the approximation. It's about 1,130.4 feet for every one minute, uh, right? Every revolution gave us a certain number, so we had to look at how many feet this was. So this is how much our, how much ground, I guess, our little plane is making for every one minute. That's the linear speed. Linear speed is like, can I measure this with a yardstick? Well, it's hard to do in a circle, but with our formulas, we can stretch that circle out, kind of get an idea of what that would be in terms of linear feet. Um, <clears throat> and it's always distance divided by time. So this is how we can work some of these uh, fun little problems out with uh, using geometry and using, uh, well, eventually we'll be using trigonometry, but this is kind of an introduce and introduction to some of these, uh, some of the vocab and some of the terms and some of the formulas that we'll be using in trig. Thanks for your time.